What I wanted to do in this session is give you sort of a broad overview of where I'm coming from <laughs> and why. And then in the next session, I'm going to talk specifically about the people of New Day, the, the community formation, why we're doing what we're doing, who the people are, etc. Then in the session following that, I will talk about the Epworth Project, which is a network of intentional communities where people live together. That's also part of the work we're doing in Dallas. Uh, so that's the plan for today. All right? Okay. I wanted to start by telling you just a very briefly about my, my own story, like how did I get here? It's amazing that I'm standing here. Um, it, it, in high school, I would, would have been voted the least likely to ever become a minister, first of all, <laughs> and uh, the least likely to ever amount to anything for many different reasons. Uh, I grew up in poverty. Uh, I grew up in an alcoholic family. I grew up raising myself and my little sisters. Uh, my mother was hard working. She was a registered nurse. She worked hard, she worked full time, and she kept bread on the table. But in those days, there were not labor unions for nurses. And so my mother earned what would today be equivalent of minim minimum wage. And when you're raising five children, and you have all this chaos in your life, and you're earning minimum wage, I want you to know it's hard to live. It's hard to get by. So I grew up with many deficits. Uh, we lived in, I lived in 17 different places from birth to age 16, and I left home at age 16 when I was a junior in high school. So along the way, uh, and oh, by the way, my parents really hated the church. <laughs> they really hated the church. My parents had experienced some, some negative, shaming, uh, judgmental Christians early on before I was ever born, and they had decided that Christians were a bunch of stuffed shirts, self-righteous SOBs. And so I grew up in a house where that, that was the general thought. But having said that, as I was growing up, from time to time we had a neighbor or one of my public school teachers in some cases who said, would you like to go to Sunday school with us? So I want you to imagine growing up with this poverty and chaos and going to three different schools in second grade and not finishing seventh grade. And there were people along the way who loved Jesus and they looked at me, this little snaggletooth little kid, and saw a human being worth respect and dignity. And I bonded with those people. And I believe that I believe that those people had no idea how important it would be that they treated me with dignity and respect when I was seven years old, when I was four years old, when I was 12 years old. Because I wouldn't be here today without them. So they were the ones who first introduced me to the gospel. And this is what I remember. The first time I ever went to a church, I was three years old, and I remember it very vividly. We lived in Big Fork, Montana, which is God's country. <laughs> It's right on the edge of Glacier National Park, so imagine pine trees, magnificent mountains, water. Okay, so we live in Big Fork, Montana, and um, they invited me to the Church of the Nazarene to vacation Bible school. And so my mother said that I could go. Uh, they didn't care if we went to Sunday school. They just didn't want them to go. My mother and father didn't want to, to go. So I went to vacation Bible school. I remember going down in the basement of the church and they had Kool-Aid, they had graham crackers, and they had a flannel graph. <laughs> and I remember the teacher let me move the things on the flannel graph, and I was, I was hooked. <laughs> I was hooked. It was a beautiful experience for me. So I had these experiences from time to time, and when I left home, uh, I became a Christian when I was 16 years old, and when I left home, I, Jesus went with me. <laughs> And over the years, it took many years for my parents, but over the years, uh, all four of my siblings and both of my parents came to a, a real faith in Christ. And my mother now lives with us. She's been living with us for seven years. She is a very faithful disciple of Jesus. She's quite an evangelist. She is a person of deep prayer. She's praying for us today. And uh, I just want to tell you, the power of the gospel to bring reconciliation to broken families. My father passed away 14 years ago. He passed away knowing Jesus. I give thanks to God for that. So 
why I'm telling you all of this is I want you to know that my ecclesiology has been shaped by my journey. And I will always be thankful for those Christians along the way. And I'm thankful for my own history. It's taken a long time to be thankful for certain parts of my history. But I'm thankful because that gives me a deep solidarity with people who are, who are kind of in the margins <laughs> for various reasons. So I was in my 30s when I began to hear God calling me clearly. I, I believe God was calling me as a very young child, but I didn't have a vocabulary to describe what was, I was experiencing as a very young child. But touching the flannel graph, that was part of my recognizing my call. I can see it now looking back, right? So when I was in my early 30s, I began to have a series of, uh, of, of mystical phenomena, <laughs> dreams and visions, God calling me in numerous ways repeatedly, repeatedly. I think God knew I needed such a strong call because there were so many obstacles in my life. At the time, I was in a church that didn't like to ordain women, that didn't think women should have leadership over men. And here's what I saw. I saw in a vision that God was calling me to a time in the future where I would be working with mainline Christians. Now keep in mind, at that time, I thought, mainline, I thought Methodists weren't saved. <laughs> Sometimes I still kind of wonder, but... You know. <laughs> I saw that I would be working in a mainline context. I would be working with people who are preparing to be pastors and people who are already pastors and that I would have a teaching role as well as I myself would be ordained. I saw this clearly, and I saw that my, my, my work would have something to do with renewal. It seemed crazy, but it wouldn't go away. And I, I went to the, the woman who was on staff at the church we went to. This is in London, Ontario. This was in Assemblies, Pentecostal Assem Assemblies of Canada church that I was in at this time. And I went to her. Her name was Betty, and they wouldn't call her Pastor Betty because she was female, but she was, she was like a pastor to all those other pastors at that big church. You know what I'm saying? She was amazing. I wrote about Betty a little bit in Longing for Spring. I told her what was happening to me, and I, my voice was all quavery and nervous, and I didn't know what she would think. I was very shy in those days. She just started to laugh. It was like the last thing I expected her to do. She laughed, and she said, Oh, Elaine, I saw it the day I met you. I saw it and I went home and wrote it in my journal, but I never told you because you needed to experience this for yourself. She said, Elaine, God's hand is upon you in power. I had a high school degree. <laughs> I mean, it's a miracle I even got a diploma from high school when you leave home when you're 16 years old and you're still a junior in high school. All I had was a high school diploma and I'm seeing that vision and, it's, and it won't go away and there were other things that happened. But I want you to know that I said yes to God that day. I said yes to God. And I'm so thankful for the, the way the Pentecostals put faith in the Holy Spirit into me <laughs> and openness to dreams and visions, to doing something different. I'm so thankful for that part. You know Pentecostalism came right out of Methodism. We know that, right? They're our cousins, aren't they? God forgive us for all the nasty things we said about people who speak in tongues. <laughs> God forgive us for judging and labeling and rejecting our Pentecostal sisters and brothers. So the call comes. I say yes. A series of things unfolded. I had to go to college before I could go to seminary, before I could do a doctorate. And I was raising children and trying to get out of the black holes in my life that came out of a childhood that was riddled with neglect and abuse. It took me a long time. But here I am, my sisters and brothers from all over the United States and Canada. <laughs> I'm doing the very thing that God showed me I would do all those years ago. God is faithful. The one who calls us is faithful and that one will do it if we'll just say yes. Amen? Amen. So I want to show you what's happening now and I hope you'll get excited. Well, Alan Hirsch uh, you've probably read The Forgotten Ways, or maybe you've heard of Alan Hirsch. He's doing a lot of wonderful work in the area of the missional church. And Alan Hirsch um, has talked about the difference between the missional church and the attractional church. And, and, I've, and I've heard him say he wishes he'd use the word extractional because people get 
confused. You know, shouldn't the church be attractive? Well, of course, Christians should be attractive people, right? But so he says extractional, and I just want to talk about the problem now. So I, I went through all that education, and here I am. I'm ordained the United Methodist Church. I've served as a local pastor, and now I'm a professor, and I'm doing what I'm doing. So here's what Alan Hirsch helps us to understand with all his research. The extractional church, you know the church with the, the bell tower and the pews and the organ and all that stuff. When it's functioning at maximum capacity, it's as healthy as a church can be. People are doing their jobs. They, people love each other. They're, they're out there in the neighborhood trying to get to know folks. Even when all the pistons are firing, it's impossible for an extractional church to reach more than 40% of the people that's with, within a, a decent distance from the church. It's impossible. And here's the reason why. The burden of cultural adjustment is on the people who are out there in the world. In the, in the church, inside the typical church, we have a special building. We have special furniture. We wear certain clothes. We have a special vocabulary. We have special songs and special books that require special musical instruments. We have our own subculture, right? Methodists are amazing. We have an acronym for everything. I'm standing here because the GBOD invited me. Right? We have, and the UMR publishes these things and those things, and we're the UMC. So we have all of this uh, subculture. And when we evangelize people with the extractional model, we get them out of their culture with their music, their language, their buildings, their clothing, their interests, their skills, their gifts, their contacts, their connections, their culture and we pluck them up, we extract them, and we bring them into the building, and we socialize them to be like us, so that they know what GBOD means. <laughs> they know what UM means. Yes, they subscribe to the UMR. <laughs> right? And the more we extract people from their, their context, the less missional they become. Because all their energy, all the juice goes into being inside the extractional church. It's sort of a tornado that sucks everything in and keeps it in the, the center. So that method of evangelizing, that method of being a disciple cultivating church is not incarnational. It requires all the work to be done by the people we're trying to reach. They have to come to us. They have to act like us. And in that model, what happens, since, since the focus is on us and getting them to be with us and do what we do and hang out inside the building that we have, the understanding of discipleship inevitably changes. The ecclesiology is shaped around that practice. So in that model, discipleship tends to be thought of as individualized practices of prayer, and participation in events that are inside the building. With the extractional model, if you ask, what is a mature Christian? The answer might be something like this. Oh, our mature Christians in our congregation are here when the doors are open. They're here for worship faithfully on Sunday morning. Um, they participate in choir uh, practices on Thursday night. And they go to Sunday school class. It's right down the hall here. Uh, some of them teach a class, which is right down that hall. Their children are in our nursery that's over there. Um, when we have our uh, Bible study, they come to the building. It's on Tuesday night. And when we have retreats and things like that, they go to our campground, which is over there. Those are our mature Christians. They're here every time we have anything. They're so faithful. And they give, too. They give between 5 and 10% of their income. They give between 2 and 5% of their income. <laughs> so they put money in the plate when they show up. Okay, those are our mature Christians. The extractional model looks like that. Okay, but as Alan Hirsch helps us understand, you cannot reach more than 40% and make them become like that for a host of sociological reasons. And I'm, I'm almost thankful you can't get more than 40% of the people to do that. Okay? <laughs> okay, missional is different from that. Missional is different from that. So 
Missio, of course, missio, that's Latin, so the Bible word is apostle. The Greek word, apostolic. The apostolic church, the missional church, is sent out, has a, a different understanding of what it means to be a mature disciple and what it means to be the church, which is a gathered group of people who are going on to perfection, as Wesley says. In the missional model, disciples, that is missionaries, that is disciples, that is missionaries, bear the burden of the cultural bridge. It's our job to make it easy, to make it intelligible, to make it beautiful and attractive to our neighbors. What does the gospel mean? What is the gospel telling us? Who is Jesus? Why did Jesus come? It's our job to make that easy for people, not to make it hard for them. And in the missional model, we're all about engaging our many cultures that are outside the building. We're all about getting out of the building as much as we can. In fact, we really don't even have to have a church building. In fact, it can really liberate us if we don't. So in the missional model, we don't want to extract people from their cultures. We want to go and be with people in their cultures. And this messes us up. It, it ruins all those boundaries we built between who's in and who's out. All of a sudden, the, the, the boundaries are porous. Do you remember in Mark chapter 2, the troublemaker chapter? It's a series of five stories where Jesus instigates trouble with the authorities. <laughs> I just love it. The first story in Mark chapter 2 is the story of the the people bring their friend and they go through the hole in the roof, remember that one? And they let the guy down. You know, I've, I've read that story hundreds of times. I, 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 could pos I, could, I could recite it to you. I've read it hundreds of times. And just a few months ago, I was reading that story again. And I noticed for the very first time, it says, and Jesus was at home. And then there's the rest of that story. <coughs> and it shocked me. Because I'm used to thinking of Jesus being a sofa surfer. Remember he said, foxes have holes, birds have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. And I noticed Jesus was at home. Well, it's possible that was his house at that point in his ministry. And if it wasn't his house, he was still living there. He might have been a, a roomie with Peter or something. We don't know for sure. But that was his house, and that story where it, Jesus was in his own house trying to, I don't know what he was trying to do, but all these people showed up and he let them in. He just let them in and he started doing inside the house the same thing that he did when he was outside the house. The lines between inside and outside became very porous. And I'm haunted by this reality that the lines between inside and outside become porous in the missional church because now it's not about what happens in a special building. Now it's about what happens everywhere we go. And now all of a sudden all the buildings are God's house of prayer for the nations. The lines are porous. And now we're never off the hook. This messes with our seminary inculcated ideas of professional boundaries and people shouldn't know us because we're the Reverend Doctor Whoever. And we should have the front of the church reserved for the sacred ones who wear robes and stoles. And so we've got little gated communities at the front of the church buildings. This messes with all those hierarchies. It ruins them. In the missional model, mature discipleship is about living like that. If you were to describe a mature disciple in the missional model, you would say something like this. That person is incarnational. The lines of their house are porous so that the people inside the house are experiencing ministry and their house is becoming a house of prayer for all the nations, uh, which is code for all sorts of people you wouldn't normally hang with. <laughs> yeah. The mature disciple in that model of church is all about knowing their neighbors. In that model of church, maturity means Okay. 
Discipleship is holistic. It's involving love of God and actual neighbors. Disciple formation is around prayer, hospitality, and justice. In that model, being active in the church means being active in the neighborhood. It means you know the local elementary school, even if you don't have kids. It means you care about what's happening with the local small businesses, even if you don't own one. Am I making sense? This is a different model of church. This is frighteningly like early Methodism. <laughs> so what do we do to unlock the church? That's where we're going to be going with this during this uh, next few days. First of all, to unlock a church that's stuck, that's frozen in the uh, extractional model, the pastor must herself or himself become a missional person which means people get to be lowered down the hole in the roof at the house where they live, which means the pastor needs to know their neighbors, and I'll get into that a little bit more. It's a new mindset. This being active in the church means being active in the neighborhood where we live, which means the people who are called to be disciples, to be missionaries, must be liberated from all the ways we lock them inside the church and don't give them a spare moment to actually know their neighbors. It means a restructuring of local church to make it easier for people to, to get out of the church building and into the neighborhood. You know the average working adult has about two to three hours a week in which to engage in voluntary activity. Two to three hours a week. Now do we want them to spend their precious two to three hours inside our building doing stuff for us? Or do we want them to be missionaries in their neighborhood so they can reach their neighbors who have need of a missionary. <laughs> where would I be if we hadn't had some missionaries in the school where I was a, an elementary child? <laughs> where would we be? Okay, and it means equipping and trusting lay people. You know, once we get these seminary degrees and advanced degrees in, in God knowledge, We think that lay people don't have anything significant to contribute. They don't have wisdom. We're the wisdom keepers. God, we apologize right now for thinking that way. What were we thinking? My husband's an old road construction guy, and I run everything by him to see if it makes sense. And anything I'm writing, anything I'm thinking about, I, I always tell him, okay, this is what I'm thinking. Does, what do you think? And he gives me fantastic feedback. I don't know where I would be theologically without his road construction guy insights. And so it means we have to equip and trust lay people to actually form micro churches out there. And we do not have to micromanage them. They are trustworthy people. If we train them well, if we love them well, if we make sure that they have resources they need for their own support and well-being, we can trust them. Amen? And it means we must cease and desist immediately and permanently from thinking, speaking, or acting as if human beings are giving units. I'm just offended when people call other people giving units. As someone who's been exploited and used, I'll, I'll tell you what goes through my mind when you call me a giving unit. I've wrote a book about it. It's out there on the table. You can buy it for $15, yeah. <laughs> what it means to be a giving unit. Yeah. Whenever I talk with folks about these ideas, um, there's always one or two people who, who says, but well, what will happen to the anchor church or the mother church or the home church, you can call it whatever you want to, if we do what you're saying? What if we downsize all of our programming and we actually deploy the people like you're saying out into the world? Won't we just sort of dry up? Because everybody will be going out to those micro communities and they won't come here. And who will put money in the plate? This question always comes up. Will we dry up and die if we give ourselves away? Have you read Philippians 2? <laughs> Please. <laughs> what did Jesus say about drying up and dying? If a person wants to save their life, they will lose it. If they want to lose their life, they must... <laughs> If they want to save their life, they must give it away. Isn't that what Jesus said? 
So how do we start all of this? Well, Bible's a pretty good place. <laughs> Genesis 12, you know the story. There's Abram just minding his own business, being affluent and living in Ur and going to chicken dinners and hanging out with his friends. And God speaks to him and says, look, I'm calling you up and away. <laughs> and Abram says, where are we going? And, G and, and God says, I'll just tell you when you get there. Come on. I want you to be a blessing to the whole world. It, it just seemed too big, didn't it? It seemed pretty crazy. The whole world. Why would God care about the whole world? At that time in his life, Abram probably thought God cared about him and his tribe and, you know, the hell with everybody else. <laughs> right? I want you to be a blessing to the whole world. You get up and go with me. I'll tell you step by step what's going to unfold so that you don't freak out along the way. And, and you've all read these stories. You know what happens. So Scott Kisker and I, a few years ago, we started working on Longing for Spring in 2007. And maybe it was a little bit before that. We were walking around at Lake Junaluska, walking around that lake. We were at a conference for evangelism professors. And we were pondering the number of students we had, the, like the cream of the crop students who were wondering how they can answer God's call and stay in the United Methodist Church. You wouldn't believe how many students I've had sit at the table in my office and cry. These aren't flaky students, these are the really good ones. <laughs> the ones with a bright and promising future if, we're, if we'll help them. <laughs> if we'll stop oppressing them. If we'll stop quenching the spirit who's calling them. Dr. Heath, how can I answer my call and stay in the Methodist Church? So Scott and I said, we've got to do something. <laughs> and ourselves, both Scott and I in our own journey, which we have very different backgrounds, but uh, kindred spirits. What can we do? So we decided to write this. So we wrote it. And the things that, that the part that I wrote, where I was casting a vision for what's possible, now we're doing all those things. I've got to hurry up and write the sequel. Because <laughs> now we're doing the, the Holy Spirit brought it all about. It's all happening. So you could start with scripture. You, could, you can take a book like Longing for Spring. It's not the only re resource you can use. There are other resources out there you can use. But start with some people in your church that are willing to pray and open themselves up to the Holy Spirit, that are willing to think outside the extractional church, and, and, and start. <laughs> start. Longing for Spring has a six-week study guide. It's easy to read and understand. You can have lay people work their way through it with you. So here's, here's what we've been doing in Dallas. Um, about four years ago, it became apparent to me that, that I had to do more than think, pray, read, and write about these things. I, I really needed to actually form some, some experimental communities. We needed to start with one, OK, and see how do you do this as United Methodists? Surely we can do this as United Methodists. It's in our DNA. What was early Methodism if it wasn't pretty much a lay monastic movement that was out there outside of the church buildings? It was out there in the fields. It was there with the miners coming up out of the mines. It was with these children who were, who were devastated in poverty and they were in families that had alcoholism and all kinds of neglect and abuse. Are you hearing a common theme? Surely we, we can figure this out. So um, I, I prayed about it. I, I asked God to show me which students should I ask to work with me on this. Because I, I could already tell, having been in, in church long enough and been in Dallas long enough and involved in churches there long enough, that when, once, church, once church people are entrenched in the extractional model, if you ask them to do anything innovative, what, what will happen? We'll dry up, won't we? <laughs> if we give ourselves away. I don't have time to go to choir practice, the administrative board meeting, teach Sunday school, go to worship service, do my job, get my kids to soccer, and get to know my neighbors. So I just didn't even worry too much about that. I just rounded up some students who were, they were available because they're students, and they had the heart and the calling. I said, look, let's figure this out, so let's instigate something. 
So we did. And we started our first community, and things grew, and then we started an intentional community house, and that grew. And then two years ago, I was uh, taking with Dr. Michael Hahn, my colleague, we were taking a group of uh, immersion, uh, a group of students on an immersion to Iona in Scotland to find out about Celtic monastic traditions and worship practices and learn about the history of the Iona community. And we were in the airport waiting to, to leave Dallas and there was a student that had enrolled for this class whom I had never met before. And he has white hair and I figured he had a career before he came to seminary. <laughs> So I said, uh, hi, I'm Elaine Heath, uh, what is your name? And he, his name's Larry Duggins. And I said, well, tell me about your goals for when you get out of seminary, because he had white hair. <laughs> and he says, well, I'm planning to, and he, he described some of the things he was dreaming of doing, and I said, wow, that's pretty similar to th the things I'm dreaming about and have begun to do, and let's talk about this. So, so it was like uh, spontaneous combustion. We were so excited to find, there was this holy energy that began to bubble up. It was so great, we almost missed the plane. <laughs> I told them what I wanted to do. I told them what, you know, these students, I told them all about it. And I still didn't know his background, what he did before he came to seminary. He, he really didn't focus on that and talking to me. So there we are in Iona, 48 hours later, we're walking around in thin space, as they say. <laughs> on the beach looking out at where these monks were um, martyred years and years and years ago. And he comes up with his iPhone and he said, I have five houses here my realtor's looking at. Which one of these appeals to you for that community house? <laughs> and I said, who are you and what are you doing? <laughs> it turned out that Larry Duggins had a background. He was a businessman before he came and he was involved in um, mortgage banking and he had the bank, it was his bank and it was, it was like that. And the Holy Spirit had called him, had called him to sell his business, to go to seminary and, 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 and to see, he's a contemplative. <laughs> and so that's when I connected with Larry and Larry connected with me and we connected with what God was wanting us to do together. So in the last two and a half years, that's what I'm going to be telling you about, what we've been doing with a whole pack of other people. So we formed a foundation, Larry and I, called the Missional Wisdom Foundation. It's, a, it's, it's in the last stages of getting its 501c3 status. And I'm going to tell you what we do through that. So I'll tell you about the structure, the mission, the Epworth Project, New Day, and the Academy for Missional Wisdom, which just launched in Alaska this week. Isn't that great? All right, so it's a Texas nonprofit corporation. And if Larry was here because he's the business person, he could say things to you that I don't have a clue what it means. But he's not here, so I'll just leave that for, for now. There's a five-member independent board of directors. It's an approved extension ministry within Central Texas Conference now. So Larry's appointed, he's now, he finished his Master of Divinity degree in May and now he's a Doctor of Ministry student and he's appointed to a two-point charge. Half of his appointment is to White's Chapel, which is a mega church in South Lake, Texas, and he's the pastor of Emerging Ministries there. The other half of his appointment is to the Missional Wisdom Foundation. Isn't that great? Bishop Lowry is a great advocate of missional and emerging and new monastic work. Uh, one of our students, you'll see a picture of her later, she's graduated now, was the first new monastic appointment in the state of Texas thanks to Bishop Lowry. Isn't that great? It's fantastic. So um, that's a little bit about that. So our mission in the Missional Wisdom Foundation is to build a generation of Methodist leaders who practice missional Christianity by living it in community. We're all about leadership development all about missional ecclesiology. And here are the three major ways that we are doing this. First of all, through living intentionally in community. Uh, new monasticism through the Epworth Project. I'll give you a whole session on that this afternoon. Um, worshiping in community through micro churches. That's the people of New Day. There are a network of those. I'll tell you about that in our second session. And learning in community. Distance learning through the Academy for Missional Wisdom. I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a little bit. OK, 
Okay, so those are our three major areas where we're working. The Epworth project is five communities now in the Metroplex. It focuses on seminary students and young leaders, although it's open to all kinds of people. We've had older people living and participating in our Epworth project houses. And it develops community skills, depth of prayer. It's organized around a contemplative practice, uh, an attitude of service, a sense of balance, and a theology of enough. It's intentionally resistant to conspicuous consumption as a lifestyle. Right? So that's the Epworth Project. New Day is a network of four micro churches, micro communities in and near the Metroplex. They're in very different social contexts. These are faith communities that are led by lead teams in areas of need, and each one of these is anchored in a United Methodist Church. The Academy for Missional Wisdom. This, this we just started. We have two cohorts. Uh, one, of, one of them is the Alaska cohort, and it includes the superintendent of Alaska who's going through it, and the lay leader of Alaska is going through it. It's pretty awesome. And um, we have a cohort that's, uh, that's starting at the end of the month with its opening retreat in, outside of Tulsa. And that one has people mostly from Texas and Oklahoma, but there are people from all over the country going through that one, too. That should be a lot of fun. So um, the Academy for Missional Wisdom is a non-degree program. It's not part of Perkins School of Theology. It's an, in, it's an independent um, program to equip people to start and lead missional micro-communities. They don't have to be New Day, and they don't have to be the Epworth Project. They can be whatever people call them and rooted in local churches. And it's not seminary. It doesn't compete with seminary. It's a two-year course that imparts missional DNA and a missional ecclesiology, both the theory and the practical hands-on learning experiences. So it's two years long. It focuses especially on laity, but we also have clergy going through because um, Lay people can't do things like this if they have clueless pastors, <laughs> right? And hey, isn't a pastor's job, according to the Bible, to equip the saints for ministry? And how can we do that if we are thinking that our job is to do the ministry and their job is to pay us to do the ministry? So it focuses on laity and clergy. It's both intellectual and experiential. It involves six distance learning classes. Each class, we do the classes one at a time, so you don't take more than one class at a time. Each class is six weeks long. It involves reading one book that's very accessible and theologically sound in terms of missional ecclesiology. And, and um, they do that online. We have a very user-friendly online software platform. And then there are three retreats, one at the beginning, one at the middle, and one at the end that are two days long. To, uh, to do some processing together. The middle retreat involves field trips to places like the Edge Hill community, right? And um, then there are two practicums with a coach. So by the end of the first year, the student going through the academy forms a lead team and starts to train them with the training we've already be begun to initiate with them. And then by the end of the second year, the community has formed and is formed in a missional context where the spirit has guided them to go and then uh, we provide additional coaching after that. Does that all make sense so far? Okay. So that's the Academy for Missional Wisdom. Part of what we'll do in the Academy is all that business stuff that can be so critically important to a ministry making it or not. So for example, real estate ownership and leasing, if you're going to have a house where people live together in intentional community, or you're going to have a house church where you're doing things like ESL classes and after school programs and you're also going to have people living there. There are some uh, things about leasing and ownership, insurance policies, etc., that we need to know and be prepared to deal with in wisdom. So we'll cover all of that. Uh, how do you administer a network of houses so that you're sufficiently engaged with what's going on in each house but you're not oppressive and you're not micromanaging and what's a good structure to use? What, basically what we're doing is we're, we've learned quite a few things. We keep learning every year a new set of things. You know, every year you make a new set of mistakes and learn from them. <laughs> you can't do missional work if, you have, uh, if you're afraid of failure. If you're going to do missional work, you have to say failure is our best teacher. And we're fine with failing. 
We're not going to let failure stop us from being missional people, right? You're all looking nervous now. <laughs> we have to start looking at failure as one of our dearest friends because that's what's going to teach us wisdom, <laughs> wise practices. <coughs> so um, coaching, discipline, and accountability. All right, springtime. So we're starting to live into spring now in Dallas and, and uh, Fort Worth area. Let me see if you have any questions or comments. The Academy for Spiritual Formation is part of our inspiration in terms of structure and length of time. Um, and, I, and I actually teach in the Academy for Spiritual Formation in some of their five-day academies now. So I really uh, love and respect the work of the Academy for Spiritual Formation. We tried to think in terms of how long did it take us to actually train teams of people so they got it and didn't keep reverting to the extractional model. You know what I'm saying? How long did it take for them to, to get it? Um, also, we were thinking in terms of distance learning so that people with jobs and families and a life could actually take these classes. We were thinking in terms of mobile academy. Could we, how, could we, how could we go and be with people in their context to offer the retreats and immersions but then have the online classes that are sort of universally available? So we were trying to think in terms of technology, distance learning, and we wanted to make it as cheap as we possibly could so that regular folks could go through. So we've, we've tried to make the price of it as low as we possibly can and still pay our faculty and pay for the costs to administer the program. Yeah. There's an old sort of joke or saying, I guess, that there was a, a wise old sage and the young person came to sit at their feet and learn and said, oh, uh, 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 Master, what is, what, is, uh, what is a wise person? And the master said, somebody that isn't foolish. And then the young person said, well, how does somebody become wise? And the master said, by being foolish. <laughs> it's the same idea, right? Yeah. I'm convinced that the extractional church is sucking us dry. Because, and I'm not saying the institution. We have to have an institution if you're going to keep things going. Uh, and some people say the institutional church is simply the reform movements of the previous generation that have been institutionalized. Um, Methodism is a great example of that. There was no Methodist church in the 1600s, and we're the fruit of a reform movement that then institutionalized, and now we're greatly in need of renewal, right? Okay, so anything that extracts Christians from their culture and takes away their missional presence to me is missing the mark of the gospel. And I'm not in favor of any model of church that, that whose end game is to get people to leave their neighborhood and, and stay locked up inside the building. And I'm not saying that everything that's ever happened in an extractional church is bad. What I'm saying is it's extremely limited. It's extremely limited. Even when it's doing everything as well as it possibly can, you can't reach more than 40% of the people. Is that really our paradigm? Is that where we want to think of ourselves? I, I don't think so. It wasn't Wesley's paradigm. He said, the world is my parish. And he went, I mean, he said, I will engage even in vile field preaching. Vile field preaching. Because in his day, you don't preach outside the building. OK, here's a drawing. Uh, missional. In a missional church, which a large church can be missional, First United Methodist of Rowlett, which is where I worship on Sunday morning, and is the anchor for two of our communities, and will soon be anchoring three or four of them in the next year. Um, they have a choir, they have an organ, they have all those kinds of things. But it's, it's, it's undergoing a transition in its thinking of ecclesiology so that at Rowlett, people are increasingly understanding themselves to, you know, a mature Christian is the one that's engaged in the neighborhood. They're making that transition. There will always be a place there for people to sing in the choir and do things like that and having a Sunday school class. But more and more, the church is seeing, wow, we should liberate uh, Pam or Bob so that they can get out there and start a community in their neighborhood and lead it. We should not insist that they keep coming back to choir and the board meetings and all that kind of thing. So it's a both and for a large church. And a large church has a significant role to play in the future. I, I deeply believe yeah, that. that. Let's talk about New Day as self-funding. Every New Day communi community pays for itself. We don't get a dime from the anchor church and we don't ask for it. It's self-funding. That should be music to everybody's ears, right? 
it should be music to our ears. Uh, with our institution in a financial crisis, this should be good news to us. But there are, uh, there are strings attached. That means that if a New Day is self-funding, it's funding its own missions, they're renting their own apartments, they're feeding the poor in their own neighborhood, don't ask New Day to also pay for the anchor church. Does that make sense? Because we're a missionary community. In the Celtic monastic model, I think George Hunter has written about this, the Celtic way of evangelism, the idea is that the, the anchor church, when you come to worship on Sunday or whenever you come to the anchor church to worship, you are missionaries returning back with other missionaries to celebrate what God has done in your missionary activity since you were together the last time. That is extremely different from, I go to First Church because they feed me better. The pastor spoon feeds a pretty decent sermon. The choir spoon feeds me some music. I'm pumped up, filled up, and I can go back into my secular world for the week and make it through another week. Isn't that entirely different than a gathering of missionaries to celebrate what God has done? And isn't worship, worship supposed to be a gathering of, of missionaries to say, oh God, you are amazing. You are amazing. We thank you for what you did this last week and here are some of the things you did. And during the prayers of the people, we're praying for those people that actually live next door to us in our neighborhoods. Isn't that very different than a self-focused, inwardly turned bunch of people? It's, it's a different. There's, there's this, again, this porosity between inside and outside, right? So the gathering together of the saints is absolutely necessary and worship's at the center of all of that, yeah. In this session, I'm going to talk about the people of New Day, which is the network of micro communities that are satellite congregations of existing churches, okay? And what I want to emphasize to us is that Disciple formation is leadership formation. Disciple formation ought to be missionary formation. If we conceive of discipleship formation apart from becoming missional, apart from exercising leadership using our gift mix, then we are missing the mark. So that's a, fund a fundamental premise that I'm going to make at the outset. Okay, and that picture is taken one night during New Day in Vickery Meadow, where I'm the team leader of the, of the lead team. <laughs>